So that is indeed the technical part of the talk, but uh, sort of to break the ice, I actually collected a few visuals about <coughs> Stanford and uh, my group. Uh, in case you're wondering what's PNRL, PNRL stands for uh, Photonics and uh, Networking Research Laboratory, which is basically just the name of my group. Uh, Usually, when I'm going for a visit like this, I tend to collect a few slides to compare uh, California versus, in the UK, Spain, and other places, uh, because it's interesting, at least for me. Uh, so what I will do in this first introductory part, I will um, just uh, give a little overview of the universities, places, uh, and countries. And then I will uh, say a few words about our current projects. And then we'll proceed to the main body of this talk. So uh, first a few words about Stanford uh, versus uh, a conventional European university, which is very different, as you will see in a second. Uh, Stanford is uh, a very un-European university, and I'll explain in a second why. And to understand why, we first have to understand a little bit just how different countries are. So I am comparing here several um, uh, states, California versus Quebec, where I'll visit later, Spain, where we are now, and Austria, where I'm going next. So if you, if you look through details here, you will see that it's a very interesting picture. Quebec has the largest territory, Spain, has the largest population, but California has the largest GDP. <laughs> and if you are looking at the GDP or income per capita, the differences become quite substantial. For example, versus Spain, it's a significant difference. And if you are wondering why it is so, we are just working harder. <laughs> there is no other way around. So there are advantages and disadvantages to living in California. <coughs> if you look deeper into regional differences, San Francisco Bay Area, in a sense, it's a bit similar to other uh, large metro areas like Montreal, Barcelona, or Vienna. Uh, the population in the Bay Area uh, as a whole is actually substantial. It's close to 7 million people, uh, much larger than the other guys, but uh, as uh, Martin knows, uh, the city of San Francisco is actually very compact. It's only 700,000 people. So most of people live in the metro area around it. It has uh, an advantage or disadvantage of the uh, highest medium income. Along with that, uh, there come disadvantages as well because uh, uh, real estate prices are also the highest in the country. So it all gets normalized in the end of the day. And the same happens in other metro areas as well. Now, why it is interesting? Because it also dictates some differences in the structure of universities. If you look at the three schools that are listed here, uh, McGill, which uh, uh, Martin comes from, UPC, which is your neighbor here, and T UTVN, uh, they're all public schools. But Stanford is not. Stanford is a private university. Uh, so essentially what it means is that there is uh, no money uh, to do anything unless you raise this money. If you want to do something, you can do whatever you want, but somebody must pay for it. Uh, so it's a place where uh, initiative uh, plays a huge role. Another important difference is that uh, while uh, the number of faculty members is comparable, at least for these schools, the ratio of undergrads to grads is vastly different. Most European schools are essentially undergraduate schools with a small graduate school. But Stanford is the other way around. If you look at Stanford as a whole, we have this, roughly the same number of undergrads and grads. But if you look on a school by school basis, for example, the School of Engineering, which is the largest school at Stanford, the difference becomes much larger. You see, we have uh, close to 7,000 graduate students, but less than 2,000 undergrads. 
And the budget-wise, it's probably the budget comparable to a large university, actually. If you look deeper into Department of Electrical Engineering, the difference becomes even more dramatic. We have a tiny, tiny undergraduate population and a huge graduate population. So it's essentially a graduate school with a small undergraduate attachment. It's a big, big department. As you see, it's about 200 faculty members. Uh, the ratio of uh, faculty to students is very favorable, but it's an expensive school. It's somewhere between 30 and 40K per year in tuition. So uh, to, to go there, you either have to have a good sponsor or wealthy parents. So going now to my group, Photonics and Networking Research Laboratory, I established it uh, back in 1990 when I left Belcor to join Stanford. We have a nicely equipped lab. Uh, it was not a simple thing to, to establish it, to raise the money for all this equipment. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, nine um, group members. We have graduated about 30 PhDs, and if you visit uh, the website of our group, you will find information about our um, current projects. Uh, better yet, uh, you know, today it's a wonderful world. If you go to Microsoft or to Google and uh, type in my name, it can tell you everything you ever wanted to know and more, more than I know <laughs> about my own list of publications. Very accurate, much more accurate than our own list that we maintain internally. So you'll find that um, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting body. You know, you, you go there, it tells you what papers were most frequently cited, in what year, by whom, when. It's, it's an interesting goal. Uh, much to my surprise, a note in the brackets, you know, papers that I thought would be most frequently cited are not, and the other way around. <laughs> so <laughs> you can always find good surprises and bad ones. And that's a picture of my current group. Uh, of course, it always changes. Now, if you look at our list of projects, uh, the main research program uh, is conducted along four research lines, uh, Ultraflow, Capella, Gobit, and QPAR. Ultraflow is an NSF-funded project, uh, next generation internet architectures, effectively. Uh, where we are trying to uh, both keep the current IP infrastructure and to uh, facilitate, essentially, transmission in very large blocks over the same media. <coughs> uh, interestingly, now there is a European branch of this uh, effort. Um, last year, as Martin mentioned, I spent a year in Madrid and helped the guys there to launch uh, uh, essentially a daughter project of Ultraflow. So it's, uh, it's an interesting effort. Capella uh, is about uh, energy efficient access to residential um, uh, buildings. And Gobit, which is the main subject of the talk today, is uh, green office building information technology. It's basically how to build um, IT infrastructure uh, that is green in the sense of um, uh, consuming not as much energy as it might consume otherwise while keeping to grow in capabilities. So um, that's where we will spend most of this talk. And QPAR is quasi-passive uh, reconfigurable components. It's basically the idea of uh, bridging the gap between completely passive components, like let's say WDM couplers, uh, and active components like lasers. So QPARs, quasi-passive components, sit in the middle. Uh, they require energy only when they're being reconfigured, but then they continue to function without any energy consumption. It turns out that you can build it and uh, you can achieve very uh, interesting performance enhancements if you're using it. So now I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to go through this project just because we don't have that much time. But if you later on wish to talk about any of them, I'll be happy to to chat about them. So any questions before we switch gears and dive into technical subjects? OK. So let's now go to um, to the Gobit project. 
So this is a project that we are conducting jointly with Corning. And here is what I will do here. First, uh, you know the structure of a conventional talk. Why, what, and so what, right? So, so first I'll explain why, what is the motivation behind this project. Then what, and what here will consist of three different things. First, physics understand what are the physics of this um, uh, office buildings. It's actually quite interesting. And then we will talk about links and then networks. I'm emphasizing um, these two words here because it turns out, and I'll explain in a second why, that what's optimum for links is not necessarily optimum for networks and the other way around. It's a strange thing. We didn't expect it to happen, but that's the way it is. And then we will sort of conclude this talk. So let's begin with the motivation. So a lot of people are familiar with two um, sort of very well-known challenges in communications. One is long distance transmission. And a lot of people are thinking you know, how to deal with them in terms of the energy efficiency. The other example everybody is familiar with is data centers. You know, these huge centers where you have to cool them intensively. But it turns out that actually those are not the largest energy hogs. Uh, the data is not easy to come by, but uh, what we have found is shown here, and it turns out that in-building networks actually consume much more than global optical transport. And that's in, only in the United States, if you were to integrate over the world, it would be even more dramatic. And much more even than core and metro areas combined. The only area that takes more energy uh, is access networks, such as PON. But even that probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be the case if it would include worldwide um, in-building energy consumption. The reason we show in the US numbers is that we were unable to find global numbers. So that's why we focused on in-building networks. That's where uh, much of the wattage is spent, so to speak. Now, why it is important if you look at the uh, sort of a picture of a building like this? Almost everybody, if you uh, talk to people who sort of know what's going on in a building and in terms of actually running one, they will tell you, but look, that's peanuts. You know, what you are spending on IT in a typical building is nothing comparatively to what you are spending on uh, lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, and so forth. And that's true. In a typical building today, the IT is going to waste only a small percentage of energy. However, there are two interesting trends. One, if you look at lighting or at air conditioning, what is safe to assume is that you are not going to want to have cooler temperatures in 10 years from now than what you have today. In the winter, you are not going to want to have higher temperatures than what you have today. But in information technology, you always want more. You want higher bit rates, you want higher connectivity, so your needs in information and your needs in energy grow in time very rapidly. Furthermore, energy consumption of other systems, such as um, uh, cooling, ventilation, and so forth, in time actually tend to go down. And there are by now uh, quite a few interesting demonstration buildings where the energy spent on all these factors combined is balanced by the energy generated by the building. So over the long run, what we should see is that the energy spendings on information technology will go up. The energy spending on other systems either will go down or at most stay stable. And at one point, these two curves will intersect. Now, when it is going to happen? Well, believe it or not, there are projections. People studied this uh, subject. And it turns out that if there is no efficiency gain in information technology, the crossover points will occur somewhere in the beginning of 20th. So not too far, in about 10 years from now. 
if you want to prevent it from happening, we need to have an improvement in efficiency of about 15% per year. Per year doesn't sound very dramatic, but if you want to sustain that over a decade while increasing simultaneously your bit rates, it's a major challenge. And how to achieve it, that's essentially what this research is all about. So now let's try to understand what the problem is. Every time you try to understand uh, a sort of a, such a distributed pro problem as a building, you first have to understand what it is that you are dealing with. So a typical building, maybe like this one, I don't know how many floors you guys have here, but in US a typical building has four floors, just like this uh, very simplified structure, and each floor is about 2,500 square meters. Of course there are buildings that are much larger, like skyscrapers, and much smaller, but typically a large peak in the distribution is like this. What happens in a building like this then, you see there are several different networks that have absolutely nothing in common with each other. So the first network is an optical network that has, in this example, just four nodes. One MDF, uh, MDF stands for main distribution frame, and three intermediate distribution frames, or IDFs. In reality, those are just Ethernet switches that are interconnected by a high-speed optical network. So that's the first network that you have. Now, the second network that you have is a copper network that operates within the limits of each floor. And those, co completely copper, has no connection to the other one other than through the MDFs and IDFs. And the third one is the wireless network that essentially provides wireless connectivity independent of the copper network. So this wireless infrastructure is then connected to the IDFs and MDFs by copper today. In the future, it probably will be changed to fiber, but at the moment, it's copper. And the one thing that is very striking is that there is absolutely no relationship, no collaboration, no attempt to cross-optimize these networks with each other. They all live separately. Sort of like uh, Europe before European Union, right? So <laughs> that's architecture. Uh, if you combine them all together, it's very messy. That's how it looks today. And that's why we have so much energy spent, it, spent on all this. If you want to try to reduce energy consumption while increasing the bit rate, you must try to understand how to deal with all these elements and where most of the energy is spent. So let's try to understand where it is spent. If you look at these MDFs and IDFs, that's where a lot of the energy is spent. So each of these big boxes has some energy spent within the box itself. That's usually about 100 watts. Then within th this box, you have various plugins. Within these various plugins, you have then transceivers, either copper or optical. And each of these sub-elements is going to spend energy. Now, where this energy is going to go and how? So this is actually hard data that we took in our own building. So that, you can believe this data, we measured it. Uh, these uh, strong colors correspond to daytime, and these bleak colors correspond to nighttime. So the first thing you will see that there is a very little difference, at least in this column, of daytime versus nighttime. This is very discouraging, because you see at nighttime there is almost no traffic, everybody is home. What it means is that the network is built today in such a way that it's very wasteful. It doesn't work, it doesn't do anything, and yet it spends the same amount of energy. The second conclusion is that much of the energy is spent on uh, various distribution frames, both IDFs and MDFs. The next biggest component is uh, interface cards, various NICs that are plugged into your computers, both Ethernet and wireless. These guys eat a lot. And again, they eat a lot whether or not they're in use. 
Now, the only thing that, that is good about them is that if you shut your computer down, then the NIC goes into the sleep mode, and then it almost doesn't eat any energy. Very different from what MDFs do. So that's how things look today. Any questions until now? So that's how things look. Now, how do we make them greener? How, how we are going to drop the energy consumption while providing more and more bits per second? Well, the first issue that you have to address is topology. Is this a good topology, what we have today? Is there any way to make it better? How about cell size of these various um, uh, access points? Is there any way to play around there? Uh, can we optimize it? Is there such thing as an optimum? Now, those of you who work on fiber know that people in uh, fiber today are very excited about radio over fiber. So in conventional uh, fiber networks, you transmit baseband data, such and such number of gigabits per second. And we call this technology a uh, legacy buff for baseband over fiber. But people in fiber community are not really interested in this anymore, right? What they're interested in is rough radio over fiber, where they transmit radio waves through the fiber, not basement over fiber. And there is still an unknown question here. Is it better than basement over fiber, or it is worse? So that's the beef of the research that we are doing, and I'll tell you what we know so far. So let's now talk about the physics of all that. And uh, I will talk first about transmission, and then about networks. And as you will see, I'm drawing this parallel all the time. It's not the same thing. If you would discover what is the best for transmission and conclude that that's the best thing for networks, it doesn't work this way. Actually, it turns out that what's good for transmission is not good for networks, and vice versa. OK, so the first thing that you obviously want to do, uh, as many people work on fiber, is why don't we replace copper with fiber. That ought to be good, right? We all know that fiber is a better medium. Well, it's almost always good. It turns out that actually at moderate bit rate, somewhere between 100 meg and 1 gig, copper is actually better than fiber. It's only at higher bit rates, but that's fortunately where we are headed, that copper spends much more energy than optical ethernet. So in a sense, yeah, indeed, if we do replace copper by uh, fiber at high bit rates, that will be good for energy, especially if the distance is large. So that is a given. It also happens to be the case that uh, the actual transceivers that are plugged into these MDFs and IDFs are also spending less energy if they are based on optics, not on copper. Now, how about this collaboration between optical and wireless? Well, looking forward, there must be some form of collaboration. Why? Well, wireless technologies by themselves cannot give you the bandwidth that you want. And people want more and more all the time. On the other hand, uh, you're not going to wander around with your laptop while this laptop is hooked by a fiber to the wall. People are not going to agree to that. So for mobility reasons, you will want to have radio. Now, how these two technologies, fiber and wireless, will coexist? Let's try to find out. So first, a very fundamental and simple question. What is better in terms of energy consumption, radio or fiber? Very simple question, right? So let's begin with a very idealized picture. Quantum limited systems for optical, wireless systems where no, no energy is spread around. That is a very important point, and I want to dwell on it a little bit. People in the radio transmission talk a lot about loss. But the loss they're talking about is not the loss that optical people talk about. Here is what I mean. When people in photonics talk about loss, they literally mean that the energy is lost. 
you transmit, let's say, one watt through the fiber, at the other end you have less. And that energy got absorbed by the fiber. But in radio, that's not the case. The energy is not really lost. It's just distributed. So if that energy would not be distributed, if you could emit one watt and have it delivered in a very, let's say, constrained manner to the destination, what you will see that actually radio is much better than photonics. You see, it is minus 65 dBm versus minus 60 at 10 gigabit per second. So it's an excellent technology. But the assumptions here are not realistic. You see, in reality, if you have an antenna that just spreads the energy all over the place, it's not going to get delivered. It's not going to be lost. And there is a, a large group of people who are working today on energy harvesting to collect this energy. So it's not really lost, but it's not available to your receiver. Similarly, uh, quantum limited receivers cannot be built in reality, even in photonics. So if you become a little bit more realistic, things will look different. Here is what you will see. For optical systems to get to 10 gigabit per second with roughly realistic receivers, pin plus TI, it's not even state of the art, you need something like minus 30 dBm. The losses are negligible in the scale of a building. If you are looking at the same couple of kilometers within a building at, again, let's say 10 gigabit per second, you need a huge, huge amount of energy, about 50 dBm. So wireless is a horrible, horrible way to transmit things. Not because it is fundamentally bad, but because energy is spread around. You are wasting it all over. That is an important point to keep in mind. So from this point of view, what would you do if you want to build a green network? How would you play the size of the wireless cell? Would you want it to be large or small? You want it to be small, right? Because you don't want to waste that much energy on this ball. So it seems like an obvious conclusion. So when we were just very early in the game, we thought, ah, that's simple, right? So let's make very, very small cells, the size of each office, maybe even smaller than that, each corner of an office, and things would be wonderful. Well, let's see if it's true. To understand if it is true, you need to understand not only transmission, but you also need to understand circuitry. Transmission doesn't happen in abstracts. There are real circuits that actually perform functions, both digital and analog. So we went through the trouble of modeling them and developing an understanding of how they do things. And then things become quite different. So this is roughly a model of a network so basically, you have uh, many wi different wireless access points. Each one has a certain diameter, and then you cover the whole floor of a building. So what happens here? Well, this is the first attempt to understand the problem. In this case, and that's very important, we are including realistic transmitters. We are including realistic receivers. But the processing power is ignored. In other words, somebody does the job of transmission, reception, uh, pro protocol processing, but we ignore the power that they consume. Okay? So here's what happens. On the horizontal scale, you have either cell size or number of wireless access points. Because if you have more access points, then the cells become smaller and smaller. And then on the vertical axis here in the red, we have power per floor. And what you see, just as we suspected, right, that, wow, you know, if you make cells smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, things become better and better. Indeed, you are spending much less power. Not only that, but the bandwidth per floor, or in other words, bit rate per floor becomes better and better. Because if you are transmitting the same let's say, one gigabit per second per cell, but you have more cells, then you're delivering much better service, right? You don't need to share these gigabits between that many users. It's a wonderful solution, right? 
we are both spending less energy and we are delivering more, more bits per second, right? We have a uh, win-win here. Well, read on as they say, right? So is it unique to this one gigabit per second? Not really. We have recalculated this stuff for 10 gigabit per second and 100 meg. It's always the same story. Doesn't matter what is the bit rate per cell. It's always good to keep the cells very small. You spend, you will spend less energy, and you will enhance the performance of your network. Win-win, right? Well, it's still, and I am emphasizing it, ignoring processing power. Now, what we, if we include the processing power? Here we have a nasty surprise. Remember this curve that used to go straight down? It doesn't go down anymore. It reaches a minimum point and then it begins to grow. Why is that? Well, because processing power, right? If you have many more access points, each access point to operate, right? It needs its own power. Yes, it will need less power because your transmitters will require less, but there will be more of them. So eventually, this trade-off between transmission power and processing power will create a, the optimum. And to go beyond that optimum doesn't pay. So that is what happens when you go from point-to-point -point transmission to networking. Now, is it unique to this particular bit rate, to 100 megabit per second? Well, no, not really. 10 gigabit. It's the same story. The optimum cell size shifts a little bit, not that much, but it's still roughly the same conclusion. Yes, sir? Uh, cost or energy? Cost in dollars or cost in energy? Okay. Uh -huh. We will see in a second. <laughs> it's a legitimate question whether we are saving energy per bit or not. It's uh, very much the point. <coughs> so <coughs> some of the plots I will show will have indeed just per bit consumption. Per bit in a sense, I'm going deeper into the physics now, but in terms of transmission energy per bit, you still would be better off if you keep your cells tiny. Now, now we're getting to an interesting point. If we do want to integrate this optical and wireless technologies, how do we do it? That's a how, right? Remember why, what, and so what. So there are three ways to, to integrate them. So one is basement over fiber, and that's uh, what we call, in short, BOF. That's a legacy technology. If you have 100 megabit per second, you transmit your 100 megabit per second through the fiber. At the two tails, you have optical to electrical conversion, and the radio transmitter sits in the end of your link. Now, the second option is analog ROF. ROF stands for radio over fiber. So in this case, you still have your optical, electrical, and optical, electrical two, at the two tails. But at the end of the link, you only have a power amplifier. The transmitter sits in the beginning of the link. So the signal that travels through the fiber is an analog signal. Now, somewhere in the middle, you have digital ROF or digitized ROF, where you take this analog signal and you digitize it. So then the signal traveling through the fiber is a digital signal, all right, but it's not the same signal that you begin with. It's going to have a higher bit rate. Okay? So those are the three technologies. And the basic question is, now, which one of them is better in terms of energy? Now, here the situation becomes very difficult to understand very rapidly. Why is that? Because, you see, if you look only at one link, you get one conclusion. But if you look at the network, it's a different ball game. Why is that? Well, because remember this global architecture of a building, right? You have a distribution frame, and from there you distribute. 
So this analog growth and digitized growth offer you an advantage of being able to centralize and share your resources. So you can have a single DSP processor that will sit at the beginning and will be time shared between all of them. And that changes the situation quite dramatically. Now let's see what happens here. So those are details that explain the architecture of the three technologies. I doubt uh, if uh, everybody is interested in them, but basically that's a legacy basement over fiber, just basic optical transmission, and you have RF transmitter at the tail, analog growth, the transmitter sits here in the beginning of the link, and then in the end you only have power amplifier, and then digital growth, which is very similar to analog growth, but you have ADC, analog to digital converter here, and then digital to analog at the receiver side. For the uplink, you reverse everything. Okay. Any questions about these structures? Looks like you guys have a question or a comment. Good, good point. Indeed, one of the uh, scary things about this guy is, right, you must have a fast ADC. And it must be, of course, much faster than the bit rate of a single bit, but not as fast as you might suspect. I'll give you a couple of examples why it is so. Let's say that you are transmitting one gigabit per second of payload, and you put it on a carrier that is 10 gigahertz. So conventional Nyquist theory tells you that you must sample at twice the rate of, of the carrier, right? So that would imply the sampling rate of 20 gigabit per second, just to transmit one gigabit per second of payload, which is a horrible thing to do, right? But fortunately, you don't have to do that. Why is that? Well, because you can do what is known as undersampling. Because remember, even if your central carrier frequency is 10 gigahertz, but the bandwidth occupied around it is much more narrow. So the necessary sampling rate is determined by the bandwidth of your signal, not by the carrier. And you might be able to utilize it, and I'll show in a second how. The most obvious way you can guess, you just down convert. Right? You transmit, you down convert, sample, transmit, and then up convert again. That's not the only way of doing things. And you'll see in a second what I mean. So in the first case, you have a digital signal traveling in. Oops. In the second, oh, shoot, animations never work properly. OK. In the second case, the analog signal is transmitted here. And then here, you see digital signal here, analog to the ADC, digital again, but at much higher bit rate, as you pointed out, and then back again to the analog domain. So it's a quite complicated chain of events. Now, each one, it turns out, have some advantages and some disadvantages. Some of them are obvious, some of them are not. One thing that might be not obvious is that with digital ROF, you can centralize your resources in a much more efficient way. Because everything is digital, so essentially you have one big DSP chip sitting at the MDF that handles the job for everybody. That can be very efficient. Now, if you try to put this all together and try to understand what does it do to energy, well, just to spell out various uh, parameters so that we wouldn't lose track of what's going on, there is a payload bit rate. Those are the actual bits that you are transmitting. Let's say 100 megabit per second, or 1 gig per second, or 10, whatever your bit rate that you want to actually transmit. Now, but then there is a baud rate. That's the modulation rate on the RF carrier. That's very different, right? Let's say you may transmit 10 gigabit per second, but maybe the modulation rate would be 2.5 gigabaud per second, or even less. Now, the RF bandwidth might be even smaller because of the shaping. The RF carrier frequency might be much higher. The sampling rate, as we just discussed, 
will be actually closer to the payload bitrate time sum factor than twice that of carrier, carrier if you are doing things right. And then there is a Dirov bitrate, which is substantially higher. Right? So keep track of all these things. The relationship between all these parameters is not trivial. So here is what happens. So you have the initial bandwidth here. Then you have an analog signal. You have an ADC in Dirov. And then you're transmitting. So here is an example of under something, just what I, as I promised. In the example that I illustrate, the carrier frequency is twice the bandwidth, or twice the bit, or I'm sorry, four times the bit rate. So it's a two and a half gigabit per second of payload. The carrier frequency is 10, 10 gigahertz. What happens here? Well, have a look. You will sample like this twice per period. That's a conventional sampling, right? What you will see if on the spectrum, you will see the first peak at four times the bit rate, very inefficient. And then the next one would be at three times carrier frequency, which is 12 times the bit rate, and so forth. It's a pretty horrible spectrum. But you don't have to do that. You can do under sampling because your sampling rate is determined, the necessary sampling rate is determined by the payload, not by the carrier. And then you would have sampling here at substantially lower rate. And then the peaks of the carrier, uh, peaks of the spectrum will come at once the carrier frequency and even at one half of that and even around the basement. So if you can find the part of spectrum that you want, you can be much more efficient. Yes, sir. Well, it's a legitimate question. And technologically, uh, it's a valid point. Maybe you don't even want to do it. But you see, people want both analog ROF and digital ROF for completely different reasons, not for the reasons of pure energy consumption. That is something that I actually wanted to discuss in the end. But since you asked this question, you see, <coughs> There are many things in this world that happen for other than technical reasons. Example one is political systems, wars, uh, human conflicts, right? <laughs> so not everything is dictated by technology. In this particular case, there is a very, very strong push toward analog growth. Even though, as we will see in a second, it's a horrible way of doing things in terms of energy efficiency. Why is that? Well, because you see, the remote nodes in case of analog growth are so simple and so independent of the format of the bit rate of everything that you can build and forget. And build and forget, that's what managers of all types, they just love it. They say, today we have one standard, tomorrow uh, you know, we have LT in uh, wireless transmission. Now they are already defining fifth generation LTE networks. Who knows what will be in 10 years from now. But the remote node remains the same. There is a huge, huge advantage. So even if technologically speaking, it doesn't make much sense, it sometimes things happen for semi-technological reasons. Uh, here is a very simple example that is happening even today. There are many garage installations and uh, underground metro installations where people want to have wireless access. And what they install there is analog growth. Just because there are many different standards, many different networks, they don't want to build a separate sub-network for every new carrier or every new standard. Just build it, analog, tail, and you forget about it. You transmit whatever you want to transmit. Now, up and down conversion, just as you guys asked the question, 
indeed, what happens, you, you up-convert using your transmitter, but then you down-convert. How can you do it? Well, there are two ways to do it. One is to use a separate local oscillator, even though it looks ridiculous, but <laughs> actually, energy-wise, it's very efficient. But if you want to save your hardware, you don't even have to have a, a separate local oscillator. You can just install an additional bandpass filter and pick up a different spectrum peak. Why is that? You see here, you have many different spectra at the output of your analog to digital converter. And you just find the one you want, and you are done. So technologically, it's uh, very simple to do. Now, if it's a good thing in terms of energy, probably not. This plot compares, um, and this time it's exactly what you asked for. It's energy per bit in uh, nanojoules per bit versus spectral lobe number. It turns out that utilizing higher spectral lobes, like in case of ADC, it's not a good way of doing things. So it's much better to use the first lobe, even using a separate local oscillator, than to keep your hardware simple. Now, if you try to put all this together, what happens? Well, here's what happens. If you are using very simple photodiodes, then analog growth is horrible. <laughs> you spend so much more energy than everybody else that it really <laughs> doesn't make any sense. But that's only true if you are using very simple receivers, just like what people are doing today. Photodiode plus 50 ohm, and then you are done. It's simple to build, but it's very inefficient. If you are building a better receiver with a trans impedance amplifier, you can reduce the energy dramatically. If you do, it's very interesting. Then you get very close to DROF, to digital ROF. And even basement over fiber, which is better than all of them, becomes uh, close. It's still much better but, than these two guys, but the difference becomes smaller. And why I'm emphasizing this point? Because if the difference is small, then your decision will not be driven by energy. It will be driven by other factors. Now, what is the difference indeed? Well, uh, it depends on the cell size and on the transmission distance. If your cell is big, then DROF requires a lot of energy, then analog growth, then basement over fiber. And the largest component is the power amplifier. But if your cell size is small, five meters, one room, one office, roughly speaking, the difference between them is not that dramatic anymore. It's, it's important. Now, we also did uh, experiments, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the details, but we did build this thing in the lab just to verify if models work correctly, and it turns out that it all agrees with, with the models, so it all works fine. And now let's have a look at what happens with networks. As I implied previously, you see, if you are using basement over fiber, your signal processing is distributed because each link must have its own DSP at the tail of the link and at the beginning of the link. So there is no sharing. Now, if you are, on the other hand, building analog growth, then your analog processing will be distributed, but DSP can be shared. And that's much more efficient. It's like sharing the road, right? You build one road for many vehicles. It's a very powerful argument. <coughs> In case of digitized drove, essentially almost everything can be shared because everything is digital. So you build one big DSP chip that is going to sit here, and off you go. It's a pretty powerful thing. If you try to put it all together, here is what happens. If you look at just uh, <coughs> the energy per bit, just as uh, you guys wanted to see, what you see is that the smaller the cell, or in other words, the more units, the more remote antenna units you place per floor, the better you are off. Still know that the difference between these three guys becomes very small at small cells. 
Now, if you look at the power per floor, then it's a different ball game because again, remember this uh, phenomenon, right? You are sharing power <coughs> and you must take into account the power consumed by various DSP units. Then there is a clear optimum. The optimum point happens to be somewhere between 20 meters and, uh, and uh, maybe six or seven meters. It depends on the technology, but there is a definitive optimum point. And if you are operating at this point, you can be very close with Dirov to both. Why it is important? Because you see, again, if the difference is tiny, who cares, right? So yes, okay, so you'll be a little bit more energy efficient, but if because of that, with DROF, if you can build a system that will be essentially independent of the transmission format and can survive more generations, it's a pretty powerful thing. So to summarize all, all this, it's a lot of information as you see. So there are definitive answer to the optimum cell size. There is in fact an optimum cell size. Depending on the technology, it can be either somewhere between 20 and 30, or maybe even smaller, depending on whether you're using both or AROF or DROF. Now, links, if you are looking just a li at a link, then basement over fiber cannot be beaten. It's, it's better. But if you're looking at a network, then ROF can be better, especially digital ROF. But, you see, the thing is that the difference between AROF and DROF and uh, both becomes small if they're designed with small cell size or optimum cell size. And then your decisions will be driven not by the differences in them, but by other parameters, like ability to manage them effectively. So it's a, it's a complicated game, and different organizations might reach different conclusions. But clearly, if you're looking after just optimum uh, uh, energy, then uh, that's how it looks. With small cells, you want to use AROF. With medium cells, you want to use DROF. For large cells, you want to use both. That's how it looks if your cell sizes are fixed. So <coughs> the big advantage of analog growth is simple remote antenna unit. You just put it, just simple antenna, power amplifier, fire and forget, doesn't change at all, very robust. So it's not the best thing in terms of energy, but it has other advantages. And if your system is optimized in terms of cell size, other parameters, it might be still a good solution. Even though, again, it's not the best thing in terms of energy. DROV uh, is robust. It's a good thing. You can move things around. You need to move your access point from one point to another. It's very robust, very good technology. It's not the best. It's not as good as uh, basement over fiber, but it's robust. Now, another interesting thing, I didn't have time to go into this partly because it is uh, sort of a boring thing for a talk of this nature, but you see, <coughs> the specific numbers that I showed correspond to particular values of parameters. If you change these parameters a little bit, you will see that the optimum cell size move around a little bit. But the relative conclusions always remain the same. So what I said about the comparison of AROF versus BROF versus DROF is solid. Even if you change, you know, uh, if you get a better power amplifier or a lower noise receiver, it doesn't matter. So there is something very, very physically prudent here, and we discussed it in the beginning of the talk, that dictates its conclusion. It's much more than just numerics of the simulations. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, we are not at the end of this project. We will continue to push it forward. Uh, we do have some ideas how to bring the performance even better than what we have today, but that's what we know today. So thank you for your attention.